Hi, everybody. It's really nice um, that you're all here. I wish I could see your faces, um, but I, I scrolled through some of your names to feel like I, I at least know who's here a little bit. Um, so this is definitely a pivot from some of the other workshops that, that you might have had so far here. Um, but I, I hope by the end of it, uh, we're all able to see um, the power of, of sharing and telling stories and also um, have some specific goals for, for making this uh, a part of the communities that you're all that you're all in. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I might have to switch back and forth screens a couple times. Um, so bear with me if it if it gets a little bit technically uh, difficult technologically difficult. <laughs> um, okay, so um, once again, I'm Izzy. Um, I'm going to talk um, with all of you today about uh, sharing and telling stories and why telling stories matters to women in data science as our community, but also to all of the communities that you all are a part of. Um, and then I, I hope to also give you some, some tools for how you can share stories in those communities as well. Um, so just to get started, I am going to incorporate a couple polls um, into this workshop so that we can all feel like we're engaging in a conversation together. Um, so as I'm talking, if something resonates with you, feel free to just you know put it in the chat. Um, if you have any questions throughout or want me to speak more specifically about something, please put that in the chat as well. Um, for the polling activities, they are going to happen through Poll Everywhere. So there are two ways you can engage with these polls. Um, you can go to this, this website, polleb.com slash Isabel Aguiar 204. Um, and then as I ask questions, they will be posted there. Um, you can also text um, my name and 204 to this phone number just to um, get involved in, in the poll. Poll, and then as questions come up, you can just text your response. So um, if it's a yes, no, you can text A or B, um, or if they're free response, like a lot of them are going to be, you can just text your answer. So whichever way you'd most prefer to be engaged with, with this subject. So by the end of this workshop, I hope you'll be able to um, do three concrete things. So first of all, know why telling and sharing stories is so important to our communities. Um, to have a tool set for learning how to tell stories. So in your own communities, as I've mentioned, I want you to not feel intimidated by wanting to seek out these stories or to share your own stories as well. So I hope to give you some really specific things for how that um, can be made less intimidating or make it a little bit easier. Um, and then also just to feel empowered to share your stories and to help other people share their stories in your communities. So um, just to start with a little anecdote for, um, as Judy mentioned, I, I'm really passionate about communication and about, um, you know, interviewing people and sharing people's um, most human stories. Um, and I've been really lucky to have lots of opportunities to do that. Um, so I, when I was an undergraduate, um, I think it's something that a lot of people feel is feeling really lonely or feeling like nobody understands you or feeling like as a woman in STEM, like you don't have a lot of role models and like maybe you're doing differently, doing things differently and maybe that different is wrong. Um, and I was also, you know, just as a young person who felt like her voice didn't really matter or like she wasn't really, um, you know, uh, as important as some of these like intimidating professors or people around us, um, I was nervous about approaching people. Um, luckily, I was given an opportunity by a professor in my department to be what he called the colloquium correspondent, where um, before our weekly math colloquium, I was able to present on a story that I thought mattered to me. It was kind of like an introduction for the person who was going to give a colloquium talk or something in the department I thought mattered or a new math story I thought mattered. And in this process, I was able to approach these professors that always really scared me. And I was able to ask them questions um, that I thought were important to me. And this process I, I did over the course of a year. And by the end of the year, I felt so much a part of my community. And I realized by talking to other people in my department that they also felt a lot more included in the community. They were like, oh my gosh, you talked to this professor. I've always been so scared of him. But then I found out that he likes bike riding and I like bike riding. Um, 
and so this this little taste of kind of like how humanizing people through their stories made me feel really passionate about it. Um, I went on uh, to do my master's at a different school and started this newsletter that I called the Neural Network. Um, and really selfishly, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but it was a great opportunity for me to get to know people was under this, under this, um, this guise of wanting to interview them, but I also wanted to get to know them. And in the process, I was able to share their stories with people in, in our community. So um, specifically, I tried to interview, you know, people who were new to the department or people who might not even be computer scientists or mathematicians, but maybe were administrators in the department. Um, and I wanted people to know how important they were um, or new professors who might feel a little bit lonely or professors who are particularly intimidating that I thought shouldn't be anymore. Um, and then another opportunity I got was um, for women in data science um, for the, the WIDS in 2018, I believe I got to interview three women um, and share their stories, um, not just on the technical side, which also we all know matters. We all love learning the technical, um, the technical stories behind people and, and learning their skills from them. But it's also important to know that like, Maybe people struggled to get where they are. Maybe people submitted this paper to a conference 10 times before it got accepted. Um, and I realized through this, through this work that um, not only did I feel a lot more included because I realized that um, I wasn't alone, but I, I realized from, from speaking with people um, that in hearing these stories, they also felt a lot less alone. So um, storytelling is important because it creates community through facilitated interactions. So um, it can connect hobbies, research interests, personal backgrounds. Um, there are certain questions which we can talk about later, which create the opportunity for people to meet. So, you know, maybe I could ask a question um, in, in the anecdote I gave, like if there's a really scary person in, in, your, in your field or in your department or in your workplace who just seems intimidating, and then you read an article about them that says they like really like decorating cupcakes with their two kids, that of course humanizes them and makes them feel less intimidating. Um, and it can also, in, in the same respect, remove awkward barriers and, and different power differentials. So um, if I say, okay, give me a, an icebreaker that people can ask you about, and someone says, I love it when people ask me about my favorite hikes to go on, then, then that gives people a specific thing that they can ask this person and approach this person and create a community with that person. Um, and Sorry, I was checking the chat really quick. So um, it also helps people feel represented in their profession or future profession. So I'm gonna switch over to the poll everywhere um, and I'll share my screen so you can get that link again. Um, sorry. So when you were younger, did you see someone like you in STEM or data science or technology or whatever role you're currently in right now? Um, did you feel like you had a, a role model that looked like you or acted like you or came from the same background as you? Um, it looks like people have already started to answer, but I'll just give it um, about one more minute for, for people to get their answers in. So um, again, you can go to this website or you can text this to this number and then text A or B um, to respond. Okay, it seems like people um, have have finished answering. Um, and, and I also just got a question. Can you speak to storytelling across cultures? Absolutely, I, I think um, a little bit later on, I'll, I'll get to 
a specific answer to that question. I think it's a wonderful question. Um, to give a spoiler, my, my, my answer is um, I can only tell stories from my own perspective um, or, or ask for stories from my own perspective. And I can try as hard as I can to think of other perspectives. But I think that this cultural difference that, that you bring up is, is super important. And, and that's why, you know, to give my, my mission statement now, that's why I think it's important that you all engage with this craft as well. Um, so that you can use your own culture and your own experiences um, and your own, you know, goals of storytelling to, to help tell more in different stories. Um, but I, I think that there are also a couple of question ideas that I'll get to later that I think if you are um, speaking to someone from a different culture, I think there are specific questions that are a little bit culturally ir irrelevant that can then help a person speak about their own culture or speak about their own value system or speak about their own childhood. Um, but, but I think also, you know, like if you come from a, a different culture than what might be represented around you or, or like this question, um, did you see someone like you? Um, then seeing your own culture represented as well through hearing different stories um, can make you feel less alone and more included as well. Thanks for the great question. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. So it looked like at, at the end when I when I stopped the poll, 33 people had said yes to this question um, and everybody else had said no. Um, and I, I'm really sorry, that's so sad. Um, and it might not be sad, you know, for some people it could be really empowering because they do want to see themselves where, where no one else is seen. But I think for a lot of people, it can also feel really lonely to not see yourself. And as we all know, because we're all here, that's one of the huge benefits of organizations like WIDS because it's, it's collecting together a group of people that might not feel represented or might not feel like they belong somewhere and saying, no, you, you do. Um, so um, there are lots of studies. I, I tried to find specific citations because I know my audience and I know all data scientists want references and specific studies, but there are actually a lot. Um, and I, I didn't want to turn this into um, a citation slide, but there are lots of studies that show people are more successful when they have a role model that they can identify with. So we've seen this in, in settings of, of people identifying with their teachers succeeding more or people um, with role models in the industry succeeding more if they relate to them. Um, and I, I think on a personal level, I'm sure we all have anecdotes about, you know, the first time we saw someone who was like us or the first time we learned about someone who was like us and and how that empowered us to feel like we belonged somewhere. Um, there are lots of different types of representation. There's these more visual and traditional um, concepts of representation like gender, race, ethnicity, or disability. And, and that's just visual representation. So, so giving people platforms who are visually, you know, it, who we can identify with on a visual level or um, on a perceived level, um, giving people those platforms through through storytelling can can make people feel more included because they see someone who looks like them. But then there are also these more um, invisible ways that we can feel underrepresented, and I, I think specifically during this time of the pandemic, we've learned a lot about how it's important to have representation in these other ways. So these other ways can be like talking about struggling with mental health or um, talking about an untraditional path to academia or industry or wherever you are in life. Maybe if you only have ever heard about, you know, someone going to college and someone going to grad school and someone getting a great job, then if you veer off that path, it can make you feel like you're not doing it right. So amplifying these stories of these untraditional paths can make us feel like we're not doing it wrong and there is no wrong way. Things like parenthood, like, and I think this has come up a lot during the pandemic is mothers being like, I have to do 20 different things at home and I have to work. And there's, I think in the past we, we've been 
not able to give women or parents those platforms to be like, I am struggling with this and I am doing a lot of things and hearing other mothers or other parents say like, no, I also didn't get any sleep last night or I, my kid also threw a tantrum while I was in a, a Zoom meeting can, can again, make us feel like we're not doing anything wrong. Um, there are also things like queer identities that can make us feel like we're not the only you know, queer person or LGBTQ plus person in, um, in a workplace or in an academic space. And then even something as small as hobbies, like maybe I think that no one else reads in data science and that, you know, reading fiction makes me not as, as serious of a data scientist and, and hearing stories about people and speaking with people for whom that's just not true. Um, makes us feel less guilty about not just defining ourselves in one specific way. I'm going to check the, the chat really quick because I see some things. Great. Um, so then another reason storytelling is important is because it helps the person whose story is being told feel heard and acknowledged. So um, I touched on this a little bit with these ideas of visual representation is that if people have traditionally and culturally and systemically been under acknowledged or pushed, uh, their stories have been pushed aside, then by us being able to give someone a platform, by being like, I want to hear your story and I want to share your story, it can make them feel like their story matters and that their story can help someone, which is true for everybody here. Everybody here, we've seen, you know, I think social media has actually done a really good job of helping people feel like they can share their stories and that they're not invisible and that their, their opinion on things matters and their story about, about their path or about their identity matters a lot. Um, and here's a specific quote from someone I interviewed um, during one of these newsletter talks was them saying, I am a human being, not some anonymous person. And um, this, I am going to keep it anonymous, um, ironically, but this is someone I was interviewing who has a forget the word, <laughs> um, who has this, everybody thinks of him as kind of this scary professor and this person who's like really smart, doesn't care if you're struggling, doesn't care if you, you know, why you might turn something in late or why you might not need a deadline. Um, and someone who everybody was kind of scared of being a human around and, and hearing him say like, I am a human being, not just some anonymous person also made me realize that there are two sides to kind of revering someone. There's the side that it's bad for the person who's doing the revering because you feel like you can never attain some, some goal that's just not attainable of, of being a perfect person or, or looking up to someone who's perfect. But then there's the side of the person who is being revered and it's not fair to, for them to feel like they can't be a human being and they can't be someone who's, who's vulnerable or, or different, but they have to be what we put on them as well. Um, so I, I think that in addition to giving people platforms who might not have traditionally been given platforms and saying your story matters, I think it can also make people feel um, heard in a way and, and feel like they can express themselves in a way that they might not have been able to before. Um, and then lastly, I, and I think this one's really important, um, I think it humanizes what we're doing as data scientists. I think um, we've been talking a lot recently about things like algorithmic fairness and algorithmic bias and um, maybe unethical applications of machine learning and data science. And I think that, and of course, coming from my own perspective where I do value storytelling, I think that part of that, um, comes from this idea that these algorithms don't come from humans and that this data isn't a human object. When in reality, we are writing the algorithms and if we miss something, it's entirely our fault. And if we decide to choose a data set that doesn't re represent the entire population, that's our fault. It's not the fault of this inhuman algorithm. It's, it's actually on us. And I, I think hearing stories and creating a community where we're surrounded by really human stories helps us realize that 
what we're doing isn't removed from humanity. It's not something that we just get to create and apply and whatever happens, happens, but it's something that we need to be responsible for and something that we need to be aware of in its impact on humanity and how, how we use it to, to make humanity better. Um, I see I have another question in the Q&A. Um, how do you protect from manipulative people when sharing your story? Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, if, if you could reword it, but I'll, I'll also think um, really quickly about that. So I, I think if, if you're worried about sharing your own story because you feel like people might use your your vulnerabilities to manipulate you, um, if, if that's what you meant. Um, I think that's a really scary thing. And, and I, I totally understand that, that worry um, because if you're, you're being vulnerable enough to share something personal about your life and maybe that's like about an untraditional background or about your culture or about your identity and it's scary to put those things out if you don't trust, if you don't know if you can trust the people who are gonna hold those stories. And I think there, there are lots of parts. I think we can practice sharing our stories with people we know we can trust and, and being shown that um, they are gonna respect them and they are gonna respect our stories and they are gonna respect this like really precious um, information that, that we're trusting them with. Um, and then I think we can build up from there. Like if we share with people that we know aren't going to manipulate us, then that's like, you know, we're all data scientists. That's one piece of data that sharing your story doesn't, you know, isn't gonna lead to manipulation. And then I think we can work our way up and it, it's a little bit of a, a catch 22 where, I think if it's normalized that people share their stories, if, if it becomes more and more common that people want to share their stories or that people are, are willing to be vulnerable in this way, um, then I think that, that there's less and less likelihood of you being manipulated for sharing your story as well or, or being put down because of your story as well because at some point we reach this place where everybody's different, everybody's sharing their story, everybody's um, f feeling like they can talk about these things that are important to them. And, and that helps us form a community where people won't want to manipulate um, others because, because they have shared their story and they have felt how, how scary that can be. Um, I, I hope that answered your question, um, but let me know if it didn't. Um, so another question is, everyone has a unique story, how to believe on that, sometimes stories just to refers to achieve, just to achievement, I think that's a great point, um, I, I think, um, just to, to reword that again, in case I stuttered when I read it, but um, sometimes when we ask people for their story, they are, the, the inclination can be to just share the good things about your life, and um, I think we see this unfortunately on like social media is people just wanting to, to share all of the achievements they've made. They say like, I got this paper accepted, I got this job promotion, I got into this good school. Um, and so how do you know that that's the, the true story and that there weren't any um, you know, negative or failures behind that? Um, I, think, I think when we get to the, I have some specific questions that we can ask people as a part of this like interviewing process and as a part of this storytelling process um, that I, I hope we'll address that and, and hopefully dig beneath the surface of just stories of achievement. Thanks for that question. Um, so this is, these are all of the things why I think storytelling is important. I hope that um, I've given enough evidence for you all to believe that that's why storytelling is important as well. Um, so now I'm gonna move on to specific tips for sharing and telling stories. So um, when I say sharing and telling stories, I hope that you can either take this personally and use these tips for yourself in, in helping you feel comfortable sharing your story with others. Or I think if, if we want to take this approach of like, us giving other people platforms as well to make these plat to make storytelling more normalized, 
then you can use these tips to interview people or you can you know email someone that you've always wanted to to learn more about and say like hey I want to you know write an article about you can I interview you can I ask you some questions so um I know that that can kind of feel daunting um especially if it's someone who might seem intimidating or might seem like they you know are too famous or uh, too too busy for you um I I think these specific tips will will make it feel a lot less scary to do so so um these are all questions that I have asked um, people I've interviewed um, before. Um, and I, I want to kind of go through them. And if you have thoughts about any of these questions, I'd love it if you put that in the chat as well. Um, but I wanted to kind of go through them and kind of say how these questions line up with those intentions that I put on the previous slide. So the intentions on, on the previous slide were I want to create community through interactions. I want to help people feel represented. I want to help the person who's being interviewed share their story and feel heard. And then I also want to humanize what we're doing and um, give us responsibility for our, the, the, techno, the technical um, things that we do as well. So um, starting here, what advice would you give yourself when you were 20? Um, I think that that relates to this um, helping people feel represented, um, help creating community. I think it also, it's a really personal question where the person has to think back to when they were younger and when they probably didn't know things and, and what would they tell themselves? Um, I think that question really gets to people to open up in a specific way. Um, this one, this third question is, is really, I think, obvious, um, but what would you say to someone thinking of or worried about pursuing STEM? So I think this is really important for women and other represented groups to hear and to, to be asked is like, hey, like, I mean, especially if we're interviewing someone, like, it must've been really hard for you to get where you are today. But um, if, if I was worried, what would you tell me? Um, and I, I think not only asking that question makes people feel like they're, they can think about advice that they give people. But I think as an audience as well, if you read um, advice from someone who you really look up to or whose technical work you really look up to or someone whose paper you just read and maybe the paper made you feel like, oh my gosh, I could never do this. Or maybe they gave a job talk and you're like, I could never do this. Then reading them say like, hey, don't be worried. Like you can do it too. Um, I think I think really gets to that. Um, this fourth question, tell me about a time when you failed in your field gets to um, Bokra, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, and gets to your qu question. Um, because yeah, I think we have a tendency to just talk about our achievements. Um, this is a really pointed question. Um, it doesn't give any room for you to talk about your achievements unless the achievements are what you learned through failure. Um, I think another iteration on this question can be things like, um, you know, the last paper you got accepted somewhere, how many times did it get rejected before? Or tell me about a paper that you wrote and were really proud of, but it never got accepted. Or tell me about a job interview that you had and you didn't get the job. Um, I think it can be difficult for the person being asked that question to answer it, but I think it's hugely important for the rest of us um, and for everybody to hear about these times when failure has happened because there's no person ever for whom failure hasn't happened. Um, and so it's really important to hear about these things so that when we fail or when when we you know don't get a job or we don't get our paper published, um, that it's okay and that it's a part of the process. Um, this question, if you had an alternative career, what would it be? Um, I think that uh, gets to this idea that at the end of the day, we're all humans. And so we might have other things that we're interested in. And just because we're interested in them doesn't mean that we're not good mathematicians, we're not good data scientists, we're not good computer scientists. Um, it, it just means that we're, we're humans. <laughs> um, I think that also gets people to talk about really things that they're passionate about. 
Um, how would you explain your research um, to a 10 year old? Um, this is fun um, just from a purely um, you know, technical level, I think, because the things that we engage with um, in our work every day are really complex things. And I think getting someone to have to boil that down to a sentence really tells you what they find is important about their work um, and helps other people who might want to engage with their work know what about it is important and know what about it um, is, is worth engaging with. Um, the what is your path in getting here question is also really pointed. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people um, with with really untraditional paths. And I think for a lot of people, when we're young, it can feel like there is one right answer for how to do things. And when we're not adhering to that thing that we think is the correct answer, then I think we have a tendency to believe that we don't belong somewhere or like we're doing it wrong or like we'll never succeed because we strayed from that path. But it's really important that there to, to, to highlight and to show that there is no path. There is no one correct path, but there are like, there are so many, there are as many paths as there are us. And, and hearing that and hearing someone say like, yeah, I took two years off of my PhD so I could be on a reality TV show. It's a real story. Um, and that's really important to hear. Um, or hearing someone say, you know, I applied to grad school on, on three different rounds and only got accepted on the third round. Or hearing someone say, um, like in the failure example, um, you know, I, I didn't know that I wanted to be a data scientist and so I applied to a job, but I didn't get it. Um, or, you know, I, I had a whole other career before this um, that, that helps normalize these different paths. Um, and then just quickly bouncing to the, the last question, what's your favorite icebreaker? Um, this gives people a really easy in. So uh, I did this a lot in, in the newsletter I wrote for my department during my master's, um, which was, what is your favorite icebreaker? And in a big department, you know, reading a story about someone can make you feel closer to them, but what if you also want to approach them about something and like ask them a question or get to know them on a personal, as a, as a person, not just through reading about them. And so this, this question really gives people a, a specific instance to initiate community. Um, so people would say things like, you know, like I said, tell me about your favorite hike or like, come show me your favorite comic or, you know, I really like talking about books. So give me a book recommendation. Um, questions like that can really, really spark um, interactions with people. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, can we ask about imposter syndrome and how to deal with it? Um, that's the hardest question. Um, I, I know that, um, we're all really experts in talking about imposter syndrome and different ways that we've dealt with it. Um, and I, I think one of the ways to deal with it is by asking people, like doing exactly what you just did um, and, and asking people in our specific spheres, like, hey, do you ever feel like an imposter? And hearing how people deal with it, um, can can make that easier. Specifically for me, um, I don't have much good advice because I still feel like an imposter every day. You know, just to be transparent, like even doing this this workshop right now, I feel like I haven't earned it. Or like you're all gonna realize that I'm not an expert in anything, and that um, you know I'm just blabbering about something. Um, so I I think we all deal with imposter syndrome every single day on like, you know, the biggest levels and on the smallest levels. Um, I think something that helps me with my imposter syndrome is trying to prove myself wrong. Um, so I, I can't, I can't say this for certain yet because we're not done, but you know, doing this, this workshop right now, I hope to prove my, my imposter syndrome of an hour ago. I hope to prove it wrong when 
we end this workshop and, you know, I haven't let everybody down. Um, and then, you know, I, I do like thinking of, you know, life experiences in, in terms of data points because it helps us be more logical about things about ourselves that we might not want to be logical about. So in this example, my imposter syndrome saying that like, I don't deserve to be here talking with you all and, you know, presenting on this thing. I hope that my data point at the end of this experience is like, hey, you were totally wrong. And so next time when I feel imposter syndrome, again, I can look back on these data points and say like, okay, Izzy, you've been wrong every single time you thought you were an imposter. So, you know, you can feel like you're an imposter again, but what does the data say? Um, so I, I hope that helped a little bit with that question. Um, okay, so if we have, I think we have nine more minutes, um, if I did the time math right. <laughs> um, and so if, if you'd like to, um, I'm gonna open up a new poll. And uh, if any of those questions made you be like, hey, Izzy, you totally missed this other question. Um, I'd love to hear what questions you all think are, are good questions. Um, so let me just activate that question. Um, it's going to be on the same, the same poll um, as last time. And let me just share the screen so you can see some live answers. Can you all see this? I can't see the chat, so I hope you can see the screen. But one of the questions that someone came up with is, um, tell me your story. How did you get where you are right now? Um, that's a great question. It's really open-ended because um, it's, it's tell me your story. So, you know, people might have thought about what their story is before. They might have thought about um, um, how what their like narrative for their life is. Um, and then how did you get where you are right now is a really pointed question as well. So I like pairing that, that open-ended question with this, this pointed question. Um, sorry, I lost Zoom, where did it go? <laughs> Um, someone says, I don't use icebreakers. I just introduce myself. I think that's great. Um, and, and I'm glad you have that confidence. Um, if anyone else wants to um, answer um, a question or, or share a question um, after the fact, that's great too. Um, I'm just going to finish um, with the rest of this in the last few minutes. Um, so then the last tip I have is, um, is how to make people feel more comfortable. So, um, some of the Q and A questions got to this of like, how do you make people feel like they're, um, not going to be manipulated for sharing their story or you're not going to, you know, judge them for sharing a, a, a different story. Um, but then also like, you know, how do I, how do I make people feel like they want to share their story? Um, and some specific tips I have for that are just, you know, getting people to make a funny face at the very beginning of the interview or getting someone to bring a, a show and tell item where they're like, you know, this dice is really important to me and this is why um, I think can really initiate a feeling of, of, okay, I have something to talk about. I can tell you how it relates to my life, um, things like that. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about in our last few minutes is why should you be the one to share stories? Why should you, why, what's my, my case for you all to go out and interview people or to interview yourself and then share that story or share the stories of 
other people in, in your community or in our communities. And um, it's something that I talked a little bit about earlier with the culture question, which is, you know, that entire list of questions I shared a few slides earlier, those are all questions which highlight things that I think are important. But I come from my own background. I come from my own upbringing. I come from my own experiences. And so I can try my hardest to think about the experiences of others and what types of questions and answers they might want to hear. But at the end of the day, I'm only gonna do as well as my empathy will allow me to. And one of the best ways to have different stories shared and have different questions asked is if you all engage with this as well. Um, I, I think I would love it if at least one of you um, realized that like, hey, you know, Izzy talked about this, but like she missed out this entire thing about storytelling that's important. I think you're right. You know, I'm, I'm certain I'm missing out on something. And that's why it's so important that you all feel empowered to do this as well. And so you get to fill in the gaps that I or other people might be missing out on. Um, another um, just more selfish um, reason why you should do this is I found, you know, when I'm entering new communities and I feel a little bit nervous, um, having this excuse for talking to people really helps me a lot. So I get to be like, you know, I'm not as confident as some people who just want to go up and introduce themselves to someone. I kind of need an excuse. And so having the excuse of being like, hey, I'm doing an interview for this newsletter, or like, hey, I want to write an article about you on Medium, um, can I interview you, then you also get to foster this um, connection with someone and ask them questions that you might have always wanted to, to hear the answer to. Um, so that's another specific reason why, why you should do this. Um, so at the end of this, um, I hope you you now know why, why telling and sharing stories is, is important to our communities. Um, I hope you have a tool set for learning stories, specific questions, specific things that might make people feel um, more willing to share their story. And then I hope you also feel empowered to find and share stories in your own communities. Um, I think we all come from really different places. We all work in really different places now. And so just normalizing this idea of storytelling across all of our all of our professions and all of our backgrounds and all of our cultures, I think will benefit all of us in huge ways. Um, so I, I hope you feel confident and empowered to do so. Um, my, my last thing I want to say is um, I challenge you in the upcoming month to share someone else's story. So reach out to someone, email them, say, hey, I really want to interview you. I'm going to write an article about you on Medium. Um, and then if you have any uh, questions, if I can help you do that in any way, my email is on the screen right now. Um, and I am happy to send you like, article templates or medium templates or questions or um, any tips I might have. Um, so that that's my challenge for you all. And thank you all so much for listening to me for this long. And I, I hope you had fun. And I, I certainly had fun as well. So and thank you, Judy and everybody in Woods so much. Thank you.